So much of America's policy in the war on terrorism in the post-September 11th era centers around the country of Iran, which didn't have anything to do with the attack against the United States of America. But our foreign policy establishment is obsessed with Iran because they declared independence from the United States back in 1979. Otherwise, they've never really done anything to us. And it's true that Iran did back the militia that did the Beirut barracks attack that killed 241 Marines and a few dozen Frenchmen as well in 1983. And it's also true that they have supported Hezbollah, which at times, especially back in the 1980s, held American hostages there. In more recent times, the worst thing Iran has done to the United States has centered around their malign role in Iraq War II, which we'll discuss in a later episode. However, the hatred against Iran is in fact in large measure responsible for getting us into Iraq War II in the first place to allow them to play that malign role. In 1996, a group of neoconservatives led by David Wormser and Richard Pearl wrote a policy paper for the then incoming prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu during his first term as leader of the government of Israel. It was called A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm. And it completely nonsensically argues that since Iran is the major threat because it uses Syria to back Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, that Israeli and American policy should focus on removing Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq. Now, especially in hindsight, this is ridiculous, but anyone back then, especially a bunch of former Reagan-era officials, should have known that getting rid of Saddam Hussein would only empower Iran. But instead, in a clean break, the scheme cooked up had it that the King of Jordan would appoint his cousin to be the King of Iraq, and that the supermajority Iraqi Shia would just love to have a Hashemite king to tell them what to do, and then American allied dominance over Iraq and the Iraqi Shia would give us disruptive power against Iran and their influence in Syria and in Lebanon. If it sounds crazy, it's because it is. And eventually the policy was adapted a little bit so that now Ahmed Chalabi, the Iraqi exile who was backed by Iran, would himself be the interim leader of the new Iraqi state after the regime change against Saddam Hussein. So when George W. Bush came to power, and he had his personal reasons for trying to show up his father, and his partner Karl Rove had reasons for electoral politics and securing the re-election of his charge, George W. Bush, and Dick Cheney had his reasons to repay the guys from Halliburton for helping to run their company into the ground in the 1990s when he was a lousy CEO. And Donald Rumsfeld had his reasons for cramming his transformation of the military in favor of the Air Force down the throat of the Army and the Marines. And the neoconservatives had their reasons. And then they had the academic expertise to assure the president that this is smart, this is the right thing, this is going to work and this is going to expand American power and dominance in the Middle East, and that the price will be worth it. Meanwhile, of course, the entire war worked out in exactly the way that anyone else might have thought. The Iraqi Shiite supermajority came to power with Iranian and American help, and the countries remained at war ever since. And Iraq was meant to be just the very beginning. Now famously, former General Wesley Clark has told the story of going to the Pentagon shortly after September 11th and being shown a memo from the Secretary of Defense's office that had been cooked up by the neoconservatives that outlined a plan for America to attack and wage regime change wars in seven countries in five years, beginning with Iraq, then Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, Syria, Somalia, Libya, Sudan, and ending with Iran. None of these countries were allied with Al-Qaeda or had anything to do with the attack on the United States. And this was especially true for Shiite-ruled Iran that were the enemies of Al-Qaeda and had already been cooperating with the United States in the war on terrorism, capturing any Al-Qaeda guys who had fled across their border from the war in Afghanistan and sending them home to the countries where they were from to be prosecuted and imprisoned. 
So Iran was cooperating with the United States in the war on terrorism. And soon enough, America would be fighting a war for Iran in Iraq. Check out my writings at antiwar.com, my show at scotthorton.org, the Libertarian Institute at libertarianinstitute.org, and my books, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism, at enoughalreadybook.net.